A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week. It is an old fashioned feud that is playing out over social media and on the streets of a small town in Massachusetts. The community is divided over a murder case that hasn't even gone to trial yet. The victim is a Boston police officer. His girlfriend is charged with intentionally running him over, but she claims he was killed by rival police officers and that they are framing her. But first, a young woman has been convicted of murdering her mother. The daughter hit her mother with a cast iron skillet and then beat her and stabbed her. Why? Well, prosecutors say that the daughter was ashamed that she'd been kicked out of college and that she couldn't handle her mother finding out. We are recording this on Wednesday, October 4th of 2023. Our guest today is Caitlin Becker, senior reporter at the Daily Mail. She knows everything about crime. Welcome back, Caitlin. It's always great to have you. I love being here with you, and we've got some wild ones today. We do, and I know you're very familiar with both of these cases. And the second one that we'll get to later is in Canton, it, Massachusetts, it's just... Boy, that one is mind boggling. It really is. So I can't wait to talk about that. But our first case is one that I always talk about this. I always say, you know, murder is not a problem solving tool. And that's how people look at murder. And the fact that this young woman thought that she couldn't handle her mother's reaction to her being kicked out of school for flunking, okay, instead of taking all this energy to cover up to murder and then to cover it all up. Why not use that energy to work on your grades? I just don't get it. I guess when you're in that sort of desperate position, maybe you just kind of snap. But I have a hard time in this particular case believing that she didn't already have something inside of her that was a little bit of a violent streak. Because as we will kind of get into, but you mentioned it a little bit at the top, there was the cast iron skillet, then there was stabbing. Yes. The in a moment, in a rage, you pick up something, you make a mistake that I can wrap my head around. It's the putting the skillet down, picking up a knife and then proceeding to stab your mother multiple times that I just I don't think it was that sort of heat in heat of the moment. I can't believe I just did that rage. Mm -hmm. That is serious hate and rage. It's very physical to stab someone And of course, the whole time, it is your mother that you are looking at while you're doing this. Now, she's already been convicted of all this. She's been sentenced. So I I don't, what I did find interesting was that her family is still standing by her. And it's almost as if her family has always tried to support her. Um, I don't think she's worthy of it. I agree. I agree. I mean, you know, we never know how we'll act in those sorts of situations. But I do find that when we're looking at cases where it's one child who perhaps harms or kills another child, the parents still want to it's still their still their child, even though she killed her mom. You know, the dad went and argued and begged for a lesser sentence. I don't know how you could even see this as anything but what it is. But he looked at the situation with his daughter killing his wife, her mother, and still wanted to wanted to support her. I guess in that case, you don't want to lose two. I guess. I guess. I know. And as a mother, it is hard. You you love your children. But an act like this to violently murder your mother over something. And, and I kind of feel this is. I'm not sure I believe the prosecution. I know that that was the obsession was that she was trying to hide the fact that she had flunked out of university. However, that just seems like a really pathetic reason and motive. There has to be something much deeper than this. I agree. And I think they did. The defense kind of got into that a little bit when they talk about her mental health issues, which was a big part of the trial. And they really tried to blame a lot of this on mental health problems that she had been diagnosed with. But I 
again, I d- it comes down to the sheer violence of the crime, the overkill, you know, necessarily when you have two different kinds of weapons and then the cover up because police believe that after she did all of this, she tried to stage the crime scene to make it look like a break in and then lied to police saying it was a break in. Also, all of this happened when her mom was on the phone. Yes. Her mom is on the phone talking to to the the school, talking to the dean, talking to the dean about what's going on with the daughter, you know, and that's when she flips out when the daughter flips out. And I kind of get that. Would I do that? No. But I do kind of get that moment where we've covered you and I've covered tons of these cases and we say to ourselves, something happened to made them snap. That is what the, what happened. The jig was up. She is looking at her mom on the phone with the dean of the school. All of her lies are out there in the open. So she just tries to stop it wherever she can, picks up the first thing she can grab, clocks her mom on the head. The dean can hear screaming and is concerned and starts calling back as soon as that happens. So I got that. I don't agree with it. I believe she should have been prosecuted for that. But up until that point, then we cross over into evil, into malicious. It's Mm -hmm. at that point that she picks up the knife and repeatedly stabs her mother. And then, as we said, she gets into the the cover up. And that that to me doesn't scream mental illness. That to me screams that preparation and dark thoughts and almost a clear thinking in that moment, because she's really thinking, okay, I got to get this done. I got to get that done. And I got to cover this up because I'm not going down for it. And there of course could be a combination of the two going on here, pure evil and some mental illness. And I believe there probably was some mental illness, but was it to the level of schizophrenia that she had no idea what was going on? I don't know, because if you're trying to cover it up, you're staging it and you're coming up with a, with an alternate theory as to what happened. I think you have your wits about you. I agree. And then there's everything that happened preceding the incident. She had failed out of all of these courses, had chosen to stay at school, living in the dorms, still went to her sorority meetings, was still living that sort of fun college life, but not handling the academic side. She was called out on it by her mom and asked about it and lied to her mom saying my text in a text saying, my grades are fine. My grades are fine. She had a scholarship. She knew she was going to lose her scholarship. She knew she had gotten kicked out of school and went out of her way to purposefully lie to her parents to cover it up. And it wasn't until she was physically kicked out of the residence halls that things started to get bad. And then she went ahead and lived in hotels to continue to hide it. These, These are well thought out actions. She made a lot of moves to cover up her, I can't even say crime, but her mistake And what breaks my heart, I'm not a parent, but you are, and you could probably speak to this a little more. It sounded like her parents wanted to step in and say, okay, you failed out. How do we handle this? And that's the thing. You know, we all as individuals, we will always have challenges in our lives. We will fail at things. Yes. And I think most parents do understand that that kids are going to have challenges Is this an insurmountable problem? Absolutely not. We all flunk out of things. There's a resolution to this and murder isn't it. This is not how you solve this problem. She was so young. She was so young. Yeah, she is. So this case is out of Akron, Ohio. And the daughter here is Sydney Powell now. She's 23, but she was 19 when she killed her mother. The murder occurred literally as Brenda, the mother, was on the phone with the dean of the university. And it's at that moment when the secret is truly about to be revealed, all of the details, not just the, the hunches, what's going on, but the, but the details. And that's when Sydney grabbed that cast iron skillet and hit her mom. And we see a pattern here that um, often happens in a crime. The most dangerous moment is when that secret is about to be revealed. When the truth is about to come out, for whatever reason, people seem to think that the truth is worth protecting with a murder. Ridiculous. Honestly, do you know how many people flunk out of university, flunk out of school? Let's be real here. And they manage to, you know, to build giant tech companies. <laughs> it's it just, you know, she... Oh, it's so disappointing. Okay, so she stabbed her mother 30 times after she hit her with that cast iron skillet. And those of you who cook with a cast iron skillet know, I need, I need two hands to 
bring my skillet in and put it on the stove. I cannot lift it with just one hand. To think of picking that up and sort of wielding it in that violent way. Yeah, that you have to have rage behind it. You, the, and Sydney was not a rugby player. I mean, she wasn't. The, this is had to have rage behind it where you pick this thing up and swing it with such force. And then 30 times, 30 times with the knife. Oh, it's so sad. It's so sad. So um, let's get to the point right before the murder, what was going on with Sydney. We've, we've kind of gone over the broad strokes, but let's get some more details. So it's now December of 2019, and Sydney has failed three of her four classes in the fall semester at the University of Mount Union. So as I said, rather than taking all this energy that she puts into her cover-up and everything else, if you had just taken that energy and put it toward your grades or trying to do some makeup tests, Maybe you wouldn't have flunked out. I, I just think that that's logical. So yeah. she didn't want her parents to know it was way too embarrassing. And she pretended she stayed on campus, went to sorority meetings. Then in February of 24, so February 24th of 2020. So we've now crossed over into the new year. University officials evicted Sydney from the dorm. They're like, look. You have flunked out of university. You've been suspended. You do not get to stay in the dorm room. So, as you said, she tried to keep that secret going for a little while with the hotel stays. But at some point, you're going to run out of money. And if you're paying with credit cards, mom and dad are going to figure this yeah, out. Who's, yeah, who's funding these hotel stays? Someone did. Someone's going to figure this out. Not, not, I mean, when you think of some of the moves she made, clearly not bright and not well thought out, but man, she gets an A for effort, you know, for trying to cover things up. Again, you could have transferred that energy somewhere else. So um, dad starts to realize that something is going on when he tries to pay the tuition through the university portal and he cannot pay for the next semester tuition. Like it's not working. And so you think there's something wrong with you or maybe there's something wrong with the connection. And that's when it all starts to unravel. And the mom was suspicious, right? Because the mom was suspicious back um, February 25th of 2020. Brenda texts her daughter. And this is the text, quote, Why do I always feel like you're scamming me? Just remember, you need the grades to keep your scholarship. Moms always know. Anything oh, I ever tried to get past my mom, he oh, always so knew. True. Right? Always. So now we have the problem with dad who can't pay the bill. And and so he confronts his daughter, Sydney, and she eventually does come clean and explains, you know, that she's been having some trouble. And he urged, he, he testified later in court that he urged his daughter to figure this out and to not run away from her problems. I think we have a pattern here. This doesn't work, so I'm going to do this over here. Oh, no, 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 that's not my fault. Okay, she's a young person. She's 19. She gets, you know, kids don't always make the best decisions, but this is about the worst decision anyone could make. So finally, you know, there he, he, he says, you really need to talk to your mom about it. And he goes off to work. This is the day of the murder. And that's when she loses it when she realizes that her mom is on the phone with the university. So you had the, the dean and the assistant dean on the phone, and all of a sudden they hear screams, and then they hear these thuds. This is what they testified to. So the, the dean and the assistant, you know, the, the university officials are like, oh my gosh, what's happened? Because the phone goes dead. So they call multiple times, nobody answers, and then tell me that this is about the dumbest thing you've ever heard. The daughter picks up the phone and pretends to be her mother, and the dean calls her on it and says, you are not Brenda Powell. You're Sydney. Sydney, we know your voice. It's almost so dumb that you have a hard time realizing or even wrapping your head around the fact that she carried on this ruse for as long as she did. It was just stupid mistake after stupid mistake. And something that always stuck out to me right around sort of this interaction. And I wonder what your thoughts are on this, Anna. There was something about 
the dad wanting the need to talk to her mom about the situation and noting that the mom was really good at kind of de-escalating a situation and kind of calming everything. So Sydney went to talk to her mom, presumably about flunking out of school because the dad already knew. Do you think she was going to try to lie to her mom? Because the dean's on the phone telling her the truth. Sydney was supposed to be there to tell her the truth, but she flipped out when she realized the cat was going to be out of the bag. So I do wonder if her intention was to go in there and downplay this a bit to her mom and not really, she didn't sound like she was going to tell her the truth, even though the dad sent her in there with that express purpose. And it sounds like she may have been hot-headed in the past because if dad's saying, well, mom's really good at de-escalating a situation, it sounds like they're anticipating did need to be a little wild. I, I do agree with you, Caitlin. I think your gut is right. I don't see how all of a sudden Sydney would pivot and become mature, reasonable Sydney. I, I just don't see that, especially when for whatever reason, she seems to be able to talk to her dad, but when it comes to mom, it's very volatile. So the that relationship, I think, is the area where Sydney can't just just can't hold it together long enough um, to really talk about something maturely. I just don't see that in her. That's just my gut. I have no proof. That's just my gut. Well, we see it in the exchanges. She went to her dad and admitted that she was suspended. But when her mom called her on it, she was flippant and gave her an attitude. So I think you're nail right on the head that they had two very different relationships. Yeah. And it's actually the school officials who were on the phone with Brenda, the mom, who called the police because, you know, they're hearing screaming, the, they are hearing thuds, they are, uh, the phone is dead. And then when they finally get someone to answer the phone, it's Sydney pretending to be Bredna. So th there's no any, there's nothing positive in all of this. So I think they absolutely did the right thing by calling the authorities. But by this point, it was frankly too late. By the, by the time they got to the home, it, it, it was quite a situation. And what situation was it? Because Sydney is telling a different story about what everyone is seeing here. So the Akron police arrived at 1 p.m. on March 3rd of 2020. This is the date. Uh, Brenda has life-threatening injuries and Sydney has some injuries as if she was in a fight. But um, the interesting thing is Sydney tells a completely different story. Now, when the cops arrive, they have the body cam on. So they captured the entire scene and Sydney's version of events. Sydney's version of events are that there was an intruder. That's who did all of this, of course. She said that a masked intruder entered the home and that Brenda, the mother, she says her mother told her to run, okay, and uh, that Sydney said she could hear screaming inside the house. And then when she returned, Brenda was on the floor. Prosecutors um, allege really that it was Sydney the whole time. Now, here's the other thing. Sydney broke a window to make it look like it was a different kind of crime scene. So think about it. She is always alert enough and focused enough to come up with a different story for her cover-up at every point of this situation that she has. It's never so at a loss. well thought out. It's so well thought out, but poorly executed. I mean, which way is the glass falling? Is it falling on the outside? Is it falling on the inside? Because a good investigator is going to be able to tell you which direction the glass was broken. So if she's breaking it from the inside, they're going to be able to see that. Yeah. The mother and the daughter were both taken to the hospital. Brenda later died. The medical examiner ruled that Brenda's death was indeed a homicide. Multiple sharp blunt force injuries. And then, of course, Sydney gets charged with the murder. Now, they do manage to post bond here. Sydney was released in April of 2020, so the following month, and she remained free on bond pending her trial. According to reports, her father pleaded with prosecutors to please not pursue murder charges, maybe a lower charge. And then when that didn't work, he and the family wrote letters of support at the time of sentencing. So the entire time her father has stood by her, no matter what, he stands by her. And I guess that's what dads do. I don't know. I don't know. I'm very torn here. Very, very torn. 
So um, Sydney's defense tried to get the charges somewhat lowered, at least manslaughter anything, but prosecutors weren't buying it. At trial, Sydney and her team tried to claim insanity. They said that she had been diagnosed with schizophrenia, and her defense argued that Sydney could not comprehend her actions. I think we have gone through several of the big moments in this crime. I think we can make an argument that she did understand the consequences because she came up with stories to cover up each action. It's like she knew exactly that there were going to be consequences and where they were going to come from and when they were going to come and made plenty of well thought out moves to avoid them and to shirk her responsibilities. Yeah, it, there's no question in my mind that she knew what she was doing. There were several uh, doctors that saw her and said that she suffered from schizophrenia and also major depressive disorders. I I do believe she suffers from some form of mental illness. I don't I don't doubt that. But I don't believe and the jury sure didn't believe that any of that caused this or got in the way of these decisions that she made and these choices that were very clear. So um, Sydney then at some point said, well, I don't remember anything. Tells the doctors during all these screenings, I, I don't really remember what happened. I had little bits and pieces. But again, the jury just, just didn't buy it at all. Um, prosecutors argued she's faking it. That's what they said. They said to the jury, you know what? She's faking it. She's clever enough to come up with, again, an alternate explanation rather than dealing with the reality of her life. It's almost childlike. It is. It's like, this is what toddlers do. Oh, a monster came in and broke it. Constantly. There's always a story that a toddler tells. Always. Yes, Caitlin, absolutely. A child very childlike, I would say, is is how she reacted with everything. So finally, on September 20th of this year, a jury found Sydney guilty of two counts of murder, along with second degree felony assault and then tampering with evidence. And then a week later, the judge sentenced Sydney to an indefinite sentence of 15 years to life. She will be eligible for parole at the age of 38. Honestly, that the fact that she could be up for parole at 38 is pretty lenient to a degree. I, I absolutely think it's I'm 38. I'm 38. And to think that she could just I feel like I could have the rest of my life ahead of me. She can basically just start a completely normal new life. And, the, you know, the biggest issue with people getting out of out of prison is not having a support system and we know she still has a support system so it seems like if she gets out on parole at that age she will likely bounce back just fine you know i think that her family's support through this entire process and really her dad her dad had i think an influence here on the court the jury found her guilty um and i think the judge heard all of the letters of support. I mean, I think it does say, I I will say this, that when someone commits such a heinous crime and there are still that many people who have compassion for that individual, there's something that they know that I guess the rest of us can't see. So. um, That's fair. I just think it's, it's really, really tragic. Worst decision this girl could have made. So many ways she could have gotten through being kicked out of school. Something as minor as that to lead us here. True Crime Daily, the podcast, is sponsored by BetterHelp. Have you ever had one of those episodes in your life where you've got these thoughts and they're going through your head and you can't sleep and they keep you up at night? I mean, we all suffer from a lot of stress. Well, it turns out that one great way to make those racing thoughts go away is to talk them through. Therapy gives you a place to do that so you can get out of that negative thought cycle and find some mental and emotional peace. We all go through hard things and therapy is a wonderful way to talk through it all and get another perspective. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's convenient 
flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Get a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash True Crime Daily today to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash True Crime Daily. Our next case is like nothing that we've ever covered here. Honestly, I've never seen anything like it. I'm absolutely fascinated by the by the case. I, um, the fact that the whole town is involved in this case in some way is amazing. We have a small town of Massachusetts divided over a murder case that hasn't gone to trial. The accused here is Karen Reed. And the, the town is Canton. It's got 24,000 people. And yet everyone is talking about this case. I, and I know you have covered this extensively, Caitlin. I know not just for the Daily Mail, but I've seen you on Court TV. I mean, you you have poured through all this evidence and then what the defense is saying. And um, man, people are very upset. And it's And instead of being upset over the man who is dead here, it's they're upset over the suspect. Outside of court, it looked like the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial where there was protesters with signs for Karen Reed. I like you said, I've never seen anything like this. And every time I report on this and every time I read another police document, every time I read another court document, I change my mind on who I think is in the right and in the wrong. And I change my mind about her alleged guilt or innocence. I don't know what to make of this case. It is so confusing. It is so complicated mm -hmm. and bizarre. It is. It is confusing and complicated. And while Karen has been charged with murder here, second degree murder, we need to say two things very clearly. One, she has entered a plea of not guilty. She says she is innocent and she is innocent until proven guilty. But the more important part of this, or equally as important, is that we don't have all the facts. We have some evidence that has been released, mostly by the prosecution, some by the defense. But until we have all of the evidence presented, we're only seeing a glimpse of this crime. So it's impossible to make a determination based on the filtered, filtered alleged evidence that's been released here. We don't know the whole story. We just don't know it based on what's been released. So it's very hard to have an opinion, I would say, uh, until we see it all, but some people have very strong opinions. And uh, the victim here is an off-duty Boston police officer named John O'Keefe, whose body was found in a snowy yard of a Canton house where another police officer was having a party. Now he died. Now, here's the thing. We know for sure he died. The question is, was he murdered? Who murdered him? The community is so divided they've taken to the streets to protest. Here's some of the video. Caitlin, the protesters are not only in the courtroom, standing outside the courtroom. They go to government meetings and they've been having sit-ins. It's everywhere. Protesters are, are, again, not keeping it to the courtroom, but to the whole city. And then there's the social media aspect. You know, you said something that is so true. We're only getting a snippet of the information and all of that will be laid out really when and if this case goes to trial. But I will guarantee you that these protesters will not be satisfied with that. They're so convinced that there is so much deep seated corruption in this case and in law enforcement and how it was investigated that I don't believe they will believe for one minute that the information that is presented is what is accurate. And that is very possible. What's, you know, I always appreciate when communities get so involved in, in a crime that's happened in their community and that they are determined to get justice. And I think that that's a really important part because so much happens, you know, even though a courtroom is a public place, most people don't know what happens in a courtroom. And if there isn't a feed and there that, you know, and then there isn't a seat in the courtroom, you're never going to know and see the process. So much 
happens in, in darkness, and that's when you get into trouble. So I appreciate the fact that, that this community is determined to make this process as transparent as possible. And I do think that that's important for everyone involved here. What I find fascinating, and I don't know what to make of it, is that the people who support the woman who is accused here, Karen, they don't even know her. It's not like, you know, she's this incredibly popular person who has all these friends. These are strangers in the community who have said, this isn't right, and I'm standing up for it. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I guess you have to figure they're in the community. It is a small community. Local, small community politics are felt by the residents, the everyday people. And this seems to be very much a reaction of something that has been systemic, whether there's truth or no, no truth to it. The residents certainly feel that there is. And even beyond the community, it is blown up on social media. It is blown up on TikToks. There are a ton of podcasts that dive into this conspiracy that there is corruption, rampant corruption. And the corruption is who is framing Karen. That's how they're looking at it. And these are people that have no ties to the community at all. Yes. Yep. Yep. People have, um, are, are very connected, not not because of a personal experience, but because they are motivated by what they believe is an injustice. So the district attorney has presented his version of events along, you know, that comes from supposedly the evidence here. And then there is a theory which is supported by Karen and the very angry mob that believes that she's been framed in a police cover up here. So 43-year-old Karen Reed has been charged with second-degree murder in connection with the death of her boyfriend, 46-year-old John O'Keefe, a Boston police officer, been on the force for 16 years. Now, the prosecutor says, and listen, I know that there are going to be a lot of people who are very um, sensitive to this case that are going to listen or watch this podcast. We're going to look at some of the, the, the bigger pieces that have been released. We're not going to look at every little detail here. We don't have the ability to get all that. But we'll give you a, a, broad, a, a, a broad picture of both sides as best that we can understand it. Now, the prosecutor says that Karen intentionally, intentionally hit John with her SUV, that she ran him over. Now, Karen says that this, the, the, the people responsible for her boyfriend's death that she's not the one, that it's people at the party. And she claims that something happened at the party and that they're framing her and covering up their bad deeds by blaming her and framing her. The, it's, that's quite an allegation. But there are some holes here and there which I think could lead to some reasonable doubt. What do you think, Caitlin? The biggest issue that I have with this case is the body. So she said body was found in the snow, but the free Karen Reed people, the defense has pointed out a few issues with the state of the body when it was found. There was a lack of physical trauma to the body in areas you would have expected if you were hit by a car. So mm -hmm. if you're standing up, and there's video of the car reversing. We don't see anything behind the car, but there's video of the car reversing where presumably he, according to prosecution, John O'Keefe is behind that getting hit and she drives off. Now, you can certainly see that video online. You can't see anything behind it. So we don't know if he was behind there. But if I'm standing up and a car backs into me, you would expect some sort of injury here. But there was injuries to his hands, a little bit to his arms and head trauma. So the defense is saying that doesn't track with getting hit by a car. The defense also is pointing out some abrasions and puncture wounds on his arms that they claim is from a dog and there was a dog in the house. So it's their assertion that there was a fight in the house, the dog somehow got involved and this guy died and then he got tossed in the snow. That seems wild to me because like you said, that's a big assertion to make and there have to be it was a party there gotta be a lot of people who are saying the same exact thing in order to get that story to work mm -hmm. the way the body the way the body was found is the biggest 
biggest question mark I think I have with not being able to decide how this guy died. Right, right. And until we have the full reports again and every single detail, we're, we can only discuss what is available publicly. Now, there and just is, speculate on that, yeah. There is something about a cocktail glass. We are going to get into the details of the night, but since we're talking about the car here, remember prosecutors claim Karen intentionally ran him over, that it wasn't an accident, that she she was out to get him. Now, they had been out drinking that night. They'd gone to two local bars, pubs, and then they went over to this home where the death occurred. And Witnesses say that when John left the last bar to go to the house party where all these cops were, that he had a cocktail glass with him. Police say that when John's body was finally found there in the snow during a nor'easter, that there were pieces of broken cocktail glass at the scene. And then they claim there were pieces of that same glass embedded in Karen's bumper. That one is a hard one for me to figure out for a few reasons on both sides, not just on one side, but on both sides. What position could he have been in in order for that bumper to have caught the glass, right? To shatter the glass. Yeah, unless he sat it on the bumper. I don't know. I don't know. So I can see like both sides on this one. It's like, how did that glass get in that bumper? Like, what was his positioning? We haven't heard the prosecution tell us what position John was in. Was he standing, crouching, sitting? They haven't told us any of that when he was hit. We don't know these details. And these are the kind of things that come out in trial. You'll have experts that say, based on the body and how the body was found and based on these... um, um, the, the the car, the dents, the broken taillights, they're going to say, this is what we believe happened. But we don't, we don't know all the details. But also, that, where's the glass from? Well, could we test, could we test the glass? Could we find the bar that perhaps it came from? Or could we test the glass against glasses that were inside the house? Which I think all of that's going to yeah. come out. Yes. In trial. So, so that's an interesting, that's a really interesting thing. And I do want to say one thing about John. Look, we're spending an awful lot of time talking about the community, Karen, the prosecutor. We're talking about everybody. I just need to say one thing about John. This is a young man. I mean, okay, I mean, he wasn't the youngest, but what? A, this is a man who is raising his nephew and his niece, his 10-year-old nephew and his 14-year-old niece, because his sister, their mother, passed away from cancer. And then two months later, those children their father died of a massive heart attack leaving those children orphaned and it was john who took those children in and were raising them now you have two children who have lost both their parents and then the one man who was raising them is now dead you want to talk about trauma you want to scream about injustice these are the victims without question yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, John O'Keefe didn't deserve to die that night. So no, no, no. And the that's other thing, really where we need to keep our focus. And here's the one thing. Again, I support people, um, you know, really get it, getting their voices as loud as possible in the fight of justice and for justice. I, I support all of that. But what I don't like is that some of the protesters have been booing john's parents and family as they walk into the courtroom as if that's vile it's not right you can boo you can scream you can do everything you want you know but not to the parents of the man who is dead they have lost their son they have lost their daughter their son-in-law why are you going after them that's where I draw the line on this one. I am that's, with you right over I that line. I just got to say yep. that. That's just like, they are suffering. And the system, the legal system is not kind to the survivors. It is not kind. And it is never kind to anyone that goes through the process. Okay, let's get back to the details of the case. 
So on the night of January 28th of 2022, Karen and John went out drinking during a snowstorm. They went to two, to a pub and then to a bar and grill, and then they met up with friends. This is kind of important. Jennifer McCabe and her husband, Matthew McCabe. And then they'd all been drinking. Um, look, I don't know what the level of intoxication was. Um, that's not what the charges are here. And there's speculation and there are comments on both sides where people say Karen was fine. And then there are some people say that she was drinking a lot. I don't know the answer to that question. She was driving the SUV. She doesn't dispute that. And, and they were out and they had, this was the third location was the house party that they went to. I don't know what role of any of that played in this. I don't know the answer. And there is security CCTV footage from inside of these bars that show her consuming multiple drinks at the different locations. I can't tell you what was in those drinks. If there was alcohol in those drinks, I don't believe she should have been behind the wheel of a vehicle that, that night with the time spent in each bar and the amount of beverage consumed. If it was alcoholic, that is problematic. Just for me, I wouldn't want to be in a car with someone who had drank that much. I wouldn't want someone driving next to me who had drank that much. But we don't know what was in her drinks. Maybe a bartender could testify to that. Maybe the camera footage sees what was being poured into the drink before it was handed to her. But I personally, like you, I don't know what she was drinking. We don't have those answers yet. We just don't. We can speculate, but we we just we just don't know. And there are witnesses on both sides right now who um, have been very vocal about what they believe they saw. Okay, so the bar is closing and Jennifer McCabe invites the group to go back to the home of her sister. Her sister is Nicole Albert, her brother-in-law, Brian Albert. Okay, Albert, the, the, these two, Brian is a Boston police officer as well, okay? So John knew him. They know each other. They're Boston cops and this is Canton. So Jennifer later texts John to confirm the address, 34 Fairview Road. Everything is about what happened at this house. Jennifer claims, and here is where everything gets really murky, really murky. Karen does not deny that she drove John to this party. Okay, there are two versions of events. Karen says she drove John to this party. He got out of the vehicle and she saw him go into the house. And then she left and she went back to John's house. That's Karen's version of events. But the people at the party say, John never went in the house. They say they saw Karen's SUV. They say they saw John outside, but not inside. So here we go. The prosecutor has made it absolutely clear, says without question, John's cell phone data shows that he never stepped foot in that house. However, the defense says they went through the phone as well, but according to the Apple Health app, different than the cell phone data that may have been mined by the prosecutors, they claim they found evidence that after he arrived at the home, that he went up and down three flights of stairs and something like 80 steps. So the defense is claiming he was absolutely in that house. This is like data versus data. I don't, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know what to make of that either. And could he have possibly made those steps while still being outside? Is that possible? The thing that always got me about Heron's version of the prosecution's versions of events here and what Karen said she did was she wasn't ever just dropping him off at this party. The intention was for the two of them to park the car and go inside. The text message that came across from from McCabe said, park behind my car, something I'm paraphrasing, but basically you mm -hmm. can pull up, park behind my car. And the way Karen kind of described it, according to law enforcement, was she had basically said, all right, I think this is the house. You run in, see what's going on, make sure we're at the right place. And then I'll park, come back at me, we'll go inside. He never came back, according to Karen. So she just left. That is something I can't 
if you and I were going to a party and I'm driving and I pull up and I'm like, could you just go in and run in, see if it's good, then come back out and then I'll park it. And you just never come back out. And then you don't answer your phone. When I call, I'm, I'm getting out and I'm looking for you. That just always, I, I'm not driving home and going to bed. I don't know the answer to that. There's a right? lot. It just struck that, me as weird. That doesn't make sense to me. There's a lot that doesn't make sense. So what happened to John? We don't know. You know, the prosecutor makes this very big deal saying, Are, we have 11 people who have said without doubt that he was never in the house. And he's claiming, are you telling me that all those 11 people are lying and are part of a mass conspiracy? I, I don't know. Is, if you have 11 people in the house, is it possible for someone to go in and out of the house with only a few people noticing or nobody noticing? I don't know. I don't know. We also don't know what state the house was in. No. The next day. No. We don't know if there was furniture overturned, if this alleged fight took place. We don't know if there was furniture overturned. We don't know if there was blood on the ground. And there was an alleged text, not a text, there was an alleged search done in oh the middle of God. the night by Jennifer McCabe that also throws this into everything else into question. Oh my God, the, that Google search. I don't know what to make of this Google search. Uh, let's get to it. So one of the most controversial pieces of, ale of alleged evidence here is this Google search. And the defense is making a very big deal about this, understandably. They say that Jennifer McCabe did this Google search at 2.30 a.m. asking how long it takes for someone to die in the snow. This is three hours before John has been discovered dead. Now, it wasn't typed clearly. It was one of those, you know, fat finger dials or whatever kind of thing that says, uh, so the search was how long to die in snow is, is what it was. Now, there are two arguments here. One, there's an argument being made that it really wasn't at 2.30 in the morning. That's when one of the windows, search windows, was open up on the phone. And so the, the data takes that as the timestamp, but really it was later. Um, the prosecution and the McCabe side are saying she was prompted to do that search by Karen while they were searching for John. I don't know what the truth is, but, but neither side is disputing that that search was done. So there is data, right? There is, there is digital forensic evidence that on Jennifer's phone, at least her phone, whether it was her or someone else, Googled how long to die in the snow. Why would anyone at a party Google such a thing and then when you later find out that there is a man dead outside in the snow? The timing is everything if no one can definitively say exactly when this was searched you you almost can't use it to form any sort of opinion because in the middle of a party like you said why would anyone do that and then suddenly there's a guy dead three hours later but if in the morning karen reed comes over which she does saying i don't know where john is and it's snowing, you think to yourself, my God, he didn't come inside. You don't know where he is. What if he's out in the snow? Then you're saying, okay, well, how long to die in the snow? If he's been out there for four hours, could, or could he still be alive? The search is either, are you helping him or are you hurting him? And if we don't know when it was searched, you can't determine that. Again, we don't have all the evidence we don't have everything completely in context here. So until we do, this is going to be a huge mystery. And if and at the very least, it's very controversial. It is very controversial. And it certainly, you know, makes you ask a lot of questions here. So I want to kind of get back to the events of that night because, um, Again, the prosecution has one version of events and the defense seems to have some answers to some of those questions. Okay, so the autopsy said that he died of, of blunt force trauma complicated by the hypothermia, all right? Now, the DA says that Karen had a busted back taillight 
and that glass was in the bumper from the cocktail. We've discussed that part of it, okay? So what's interesting is the defense says that busted taillight happened when Karen left John's house several hours later to go look for him. And they have re released a video, a surveillance video from the house that shows her backing up in the snow. And there's another car at the back wall. And they claim that she hit the car as she was leaving. And that's where the busted tail light comes in. That is their version of events. And there is a video that suggests that that is a possibility that does not deal with the glass from the cocktail um, tumbler that he was holding and how that ended up in her bumper. We, we just don't understand that. Okay, so Jennifer's last correspondence with John occurred at 1245. Remember, she's the one who invited him to the party where she says, hello, which is kind of like one of those, like she says, well, the reason she texted that was she claims that she saw Karen drop off John. So where the heck is John? Hello? kind of thing, and that she never heard from him. Okay. Police claim that Karen has changed her version of events several times, several times. Now remember, Karen goes back to John's house and then um, she wakes up. John is not there. She's worried. She says she doesn't have Jennifer McCabe's number. So she wakes up John's niece because John's niece, I guess, is in sports or goes to school with Jennifer's daughter and it's with the help of the niece that they call jennifer and and she says where is john okay now it is 4 53 a.m jennifer claims that at that time that's when karen called okay and that can all be digitally forensically confirmed um this is what gets really interesting so so Jennifer says Karen drove to Jennifer's home and then they were joined by another woman, by another woman. So now there are three of them out there in the snow, pre-dawn, driving around trying to find John. And Jennifer says that as they're searching for John and they're going back to the house where the party was, Karen, who presumably is in the back seat, screams, you know, oh my God, there he is. And he's covered in snow. They find him. All three women try to do CPR. Um, ambulance gets there. And there are allegations here that say, well, wait a minute. How could Karen have seen his body from the back of the car? Well, when you're driving, I, I can say this. The, the people who can see better are the people not driving because the people driving have to make sure they don't hit anything. Absolutely. I don't know. That stands to reason. But what do you make of this, Caitlin? Well, it seems reasonable that if either one of the scenarios is true, whether it was the people in the house covering it up that they killed him, or it was Karen covering it up that she killed him on purpose, I get that they would all get together and join the other one to search because if you knew you did something wrong and you didn't want someone to find out about it, then I'm getting in the car and I'm going to search any which way you tell me to. And then, oh, look, we've eventually found him. I just don't know which set of people were the people looking for him in earnest or were the person knowing he was dead in the snow. Even if... I can wrap my head around Karen Reed backing her car into him. I feel like the broken taillight seems a little convenient. You just so happen to break your taillight the next morning after you happen to have allegedly backed into someone. That seems a little convenient to me. Stranger things have happened, though. Mm -hmm. I could, just couldn't see why it would have been done maliciously. I could see the I could see it if it was an accident. That is what I always thought this case was. So I was really surprised when the prosecutor said she deliberately, alleg allegedly, but the prosecutor's case is she deliberately backed into him, ran him over, and then left him for dead. That never sat well for, with me. If she had allegedly had six, seven, eight drinks, was driving a car, dropped him off, 
backed up in the snow, I could see very plausibly that someone who is perhaps intoxicated behind the wheel could accidentally hit someone and not even know. Maybe you back up and you think you hit a little snowbank and off you go. That I could wrap my head around. To maliciously and purposefully back up, hit him, leave him for dead in the snow outside of a house full of police officers. Right. That's risky, isn't it? Who if knew you were plan. there? Right. Who yeah, knew you were there? Yeah, and they knew you were there, you were there because you, they were texting, pull behind, I see you, pull behind my car. I I honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, I agree with you. I'm surprised that this wasn't more of an accident. And if they were, and if everyone was drunk, then that could explain why John may have been in an odd position when, if he was hit by the car, could explain why Karen didn't completely know what happened, if that's what happened, could explain why the people in the house may have also been drunk. We don't know. We don't know the answer, but that factor could muddy and fuzzy a lot of people's clear thinking and judgment at the time. Now, Jennifer claims and this is all in the court records, Jennifer claims that while they're searching for John before they found his body, that Karen allegedly said, could I have hit him? So um, it's Jennifer who says, well, Karen was intoxicated. Karen was asking, could she have hit him? And raises that. Now Karen is saying, I never said that. She just made that up. I don't know. I don't think that helps the prosecution, though. Back to what you and I were just saying. If she did it on purpose, why would she say, D could I have done that? If it was an accident, maybe you say to yourself, oh, my God, could I have hit him? Right. But right. she's saying she never said it. But Je Jennifer McCabe's saying she said it. But e either way, it doesn't sound like if, if this question was asked, she wouldn't have been asking it if she knew she hit it. Yes. It is, again, it's why so this case is so complicated and each side really has a few things on their side to say, hold on a minute, we need more information on this. Okay, so as we said, you know, the women were performing CPR, Karen called 911 just past 6 a.m. on January 29th. Now, as we said, the other evidence at the scene, John's body the broken cocktail glass, patches that appeared to have blood were all taken as evidence, and John's cell phone was physically under him. It wasn't in his pocket. It was, again, under him. Um, and this, again, were it, the paramedics, now, according to authorities, a paramedic who arrived on the scene allegedly, paramedic claims, they heard Karen say, quote, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. That's what the paramedic says, because, you know, when people get to the scene, people are asking questions. Well, why is he in the snow? What happened here? So I don't know. I, 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 that is a hard one. You know, is that a paramedic, paramedic going to be part of the conspiracy? That's exactly what I was about to say. So that paramedic would also have to be roped into this alleged conspiracy from the people in the house to allegedly frame Karen. So a person who... And I, I get, I don't know. I don't know how small town, maybe they knew who was coming. I, I, I don't know, but that seems a little far-fetched. I have a theory about what I think happened, Okay. but, and I, what I think happened isn't what either one of them are saying. And I do feel that the theory explains the cocktail glass, mm -hmm. the position, the phone, and the, injuries to his body go for it caitlin <laughs> so prefacing this with this is my theory this is based on everything i have read this is not proven but it's a big suv he gets out he's clearly drinking he had been drinking all night i don't think there's any uh, question that he had been drunk he's walking around the side of the car i think he bent down i think he bent down to tie a shoe or he dropped his phone and he bends down puts the glass on the bumper, goes to either pick it up or tie a shoe. He's below, if you're crouched down like that with your hand where the bumper is, he's below the window. So she probably doesn't see him. So I think she reverses, 
hits him, doesn't know. And so if you're down like this, that's your right arm where the lacerations were. And that's your head where the bumper is. But which the would explain why there was no. Aren't the lacerations on the inside of the arm? But let's say you're, you got your arm on the car, putting your, holding your drink there. And you're here, and maybe he goes back this way, mm, which okay. would, if you're crouched, then the bulk of your body here isn't going to get hit. It's going to be your head and your arm. He might have even been holding himself up if he was drinking that much. So that's what I think happened. I think that explains all of that. So his arm is up. He puts the cup on the, the glass on the thing. He's bent down for whatever reason, probably to pick up his phone because his phone is found underneath of him. The impact of the vehicle would hit him here and here probably crunching the glass into him she doesn't see it because he's down on the ground drives off no one's the wiser and he sadly tragically dies in the freezing cold in the snow that's my theory i think it was accidental i think it was unfortunate i don't think there's a there's i can't speak to whether or not there's corruption in the canton area with law enforcement to think that this conspiracy involved that many people, I have a hard time settling with. I also have a hard time feeling like Karen maliciously did this in this manner in, in front of a house full of officers and then allegedly looked for him the next day and then allegedly said, did I hit him? Did I hit him? Almost sounding panic. Like, could I have done this? If that's really true and she did it on purpose, I don't see that. So that is my theory. That's interesting. It's it's plausible. I don't understand why a cop's home wouldn't have security cameras on the outside. You know, this day and age, I everybody does. I believe there was one because we and? see Karen's car and we see her back up. But we, we don't, don't see what's see... behind the car. Right. And, and, and I, that could just be an angle thing, I guess. I just I just wish that there were like a million cameras that all pick this up from every... And that's I, wish, what I, wish. I wish we could see it again right now because I don't feel like when I watched it the first time, it looked like she slammed on the gas and backed up. You know, like that seems intentional to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't so, know. It's, oh, it's so, so perplexing. So, you know, um, the medical examiner concluded that all these injuries, um, you know, the multiple skull fractures and the bleeding on the brain and the blunt force trauma to the brain plus the hypothermia contributed to his death. And the medical examiner said he didn't, or she didn't, the, the medical examiner's office, the whole team, they didn't believe that his death was as a result of some kind of an altercation or fight, that that's not what they believe. At least that's what's been released so far. Okay, we've gone through this cell phone data, which is contradictory. Each side has some cell phone data that claims to support their version of events. I think also authorities have claimed that there was some cell phone evidence. They say that Karen and John were actually arguing. We're in a toxic relationship. The authorities say that that was supported by interviews with the children, the niece and the nephew who lived in the house. So it is possible that they were fighting. You know, would that go toward motive? Possibly. I don't know. Karen has said this entire thing is a setup, just a complete setup. Um, and then there are the things that people can point to as, as possibly, you know, indicating a possible conspiracy, such as the house has been sold. And that the German shepherd at the house, who some have thought, well, maybe there was something that happened with the dog. The dog has been rehomed. And the owner had said, well, that's because the dog had a problem with another dog. Look, I don't know what the answer is. But those two pieces are now different than were, than were before. Okay, so now I want to talk about the DA. The DA has been so angry about not just the theories being presented by the defense, which is their right to do and they're going to do it, but really upset about the people who have taken to the streets, the protesters, the supporters of Karen. He's furious with their tactics, he says. So the Norfolk County District Attorney, Michael Morrissey, put together a video statement of the facts from his perspective to try and shut down some of this. Let's play a clip. 
This will be the first statement of its kind in my dozen years as Norfolk District Attorney. The harassment of witnesses in the murder prosecution of Karen Reed is absolutely baseless. It should be an outrage to any decent person and it needs to stop. Innuendo is not evidence. False narratives are not evidence. However, what evidence does show is that John O'Keefe never entered the home at 34 Fairview Road in Canton the night he died. Location data from his phone, recovered from the lawn beneath his body when he was transported to the hospital, shows that this phone did not enter that home. Eleven people have given statements that they did not see John O'Keefe enter the home at 34 Fairview that night. Zero people have said that they saw him enter the home. Zero. No one. The biggest thing that the DA says is that our 11 people involved, 11 people plus, and multiple agencies involved in a cover-up. That's what he's saying doesn't make any sense. But that doesn't mean that something else didn't happen at the party. We just don't know. As we've said, not only are the protesters going to the courthouse, they're going to the homes of witnesses, Jennifer McCabe claims that she has been accosted um, at sports events with her kids and her family present over this. So the witnesses are being harassed, which is one of the things that the DA is very upset about. There have been several sit-ins where people, the protesters have been sitting with like gaffer's tape over their mouths because they've been silenced and they sit there quietly with their signs and their mouths taped up. And, and here's uh, another bit of the protest. Here's another clip of the protest. He said that. He knows it's a lie. He knows. Hey, God, does he think we're stupid that our eyes are broken? So Karen Reed's trial is slated to begin in March, Caitlin. And my guess is all eyes on this trial. All eyes are going to be on this trial and it's going to be a circus. It is going to be an absolute circus. The protesters like you said, are, are all over the place. It's, it's going to take a lot to make sure that it doesn't disrupt the proceedings to the point where they, they just can't, they can't continue on like this. I mean, I understand why the district attorney is annoyed because it, doesn't look great for him if you got all these protesters out there, but I'm with you. I want this open. I want it honest. I want it fair. I want the press to be able to see everything that we could possibly see. I want people to have a voice. Witness intimidation, showing up at people's houses, booing the victims, parents. We ought to not be able to do this. I also fear for the protesters that some of their actions are going to undercut the defense. And some of their more ridiculous sort of intimidation tactics, again, are going to undercut the defense's ability to present probable cause. And I think this case is dripping with it. We'll be watching. It is time for our comment section. These are the cases that you all are talking about on social media. And here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. Hey, how's it going, Anna? Good. Great to see you, Kaylin. Hi, good to see you. Uh, <laughs> so this week we have a case of a good message, but the absolute wrong messenger. This case comes out of Centerville, Indiana, where a 42 year old man was arrested for allegedly standing naked in an apartment doorway and waving at drivers passing by on a busy street because he wanted to, quote, spread some love. I'll let you interpret waving however you want to interpret that. It could was he be waving ants, his hand be... or something else? Well, okay. we'll talk about it a little bit more. So according okay. to the court documents, Centerville police responded to the apartment complex for reports of a naked man masturbating in the doorway. So oh. unclear how far this whole thing went. Uh, officers arrive at the apartment. They, the suspect's front door and curtains were allegedly open. They could apparently see inside this entire apartment. The suspect here, Elijah Barker, reportedly approached the officers at the door and asked them if he should put some clothes on. Um, and I, I love this little note from the arrest report. Uh, according to an officer, he, he calmly approached the suspect here and said, I advised that I would prefer he did, which um, I, I, 
I don't know how what kind of language he used there. I would have been like, yes, get some pants on at the very least. Um, but uh, so the suspect here, uh, Elijah Barker, allegedly told officers he recently experienced a, quote, spiritual awakening and thought he could spread some love by being naked and waving at passerby. Uh, these police officers spoke to Barker here about standing naked in public, and he allegedly said that he believed he thought it was acceptable behavior. Um, he also added, uh, interestingly enough, that he used meth but recently stopped. However, in a search of the apartment, officers allegedly discovered meth in his wallet. Um, court records also show that Barker's landlord had filed an eviction notice about a month before this event and demanded that he be out a, 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 about a day after when this incident would have taken place. So uh, we'll see that. Uh, the suspect here, Elijah Barker, is charged with a felony count of possession of methamphetamine and a misdemeanor in indecent exposure, which this was kind of an interesting one to me, uh, that involves appearing in a state of nudity, not in a public place, but with intent. I'm actually not that familiar with the charge of nudity with intent um, <laughs> in, in, in any arena, but uh, that's... Um, yeah, uh, that's new one on me. He was booked into the Wayne County Jail. We will obviously follow this one to see if there's any updates. Um, Death by Spork had a great comment. They said, used meth but recently stopped. When? This morning? Which I think is a is a very reasonable ask. Uh, is it, you know, hours ago? Um, it, 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 unsure on that timeline. Definitely wasn't a 28-day a thing. Um, and is that C? Agreed with this message and said, naked shouldn't be a crime. Um I, w I would beg to differ in a public place. Uh, I, I think it's, yeah, it, it, it's not ideal. And and the waving, the waving aspect, how far the waving went, I think really maybe elevates this um, to at least a misdemeanor crime. Uh, Stand by me, great, great username. Uh, seen it all before, old enough to never want to see it again. <clears throat> Very fair. No, uh, they've, they've, they've had enough love spread, apparently. Oh, dear, said he was just checking the temperature of the building, which I got to say, Really don't know how to read the room if this is uh, if this is your checking of the temperature and 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 then asking when the police show up is, is this about me being naked should I put some clothes on um, feel like you're not really fully aware of of, of your scenario there. Uh, Sabias had my favorite quote this week. They said I would just spread some pe some pepper spray, no problem. Um, <laughs> which very different message, very different message. But that is going to do it for this week's comment section. Thank you to everybody who left those over on our YouTube community page. You can also reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and wherever else you interact with us. Thank you so much. And I'll see you all next week. Bye, Will. Bye. So, Caitlin, where can people follow you? Because you've always got an update, always, on any case that we're covering. I always got an update. The best place to get all of our good true crime goodness is TikTok at Crime Talk. Ooh, I like that. We're kind of on TikTok, but not very much. <laughs> We're there working is a on great, great true crime community on TikTok. They're super active. Yes, I know. And we've, and we've been able to get a lot of information off of TikTok. I think we just need to get ourselves together. And I'm kind of on TikTok myself. I... I personally am not. Oh, that's so funny. That's so funny. Well, everything I do is, you know, about crime or about rescue dogs. My life is very, very boring. And it's really more about dogs and other things than crime because I need a break from the crime every you know wherever i go whether it's the supermarket or i'm in the department store everyone wants to talk about a case and i love that and i love that but i want to say i do not want to talk about crime <laughs> need a little break about... there's nothing better than dogs though to make it yeah to just a little temper break. that Right. Just a little goodness to counter all the bad and the evil out there. That's all. OK, so you can find me at Anna G News on all social media, even occasionally TikTok. Uh, you can get this episode and all our episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channels. Go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter. Until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime.